But on the other side, in the charismatic movement, came people that had out of Bible experiences. Mm. And they began to feel and get a hearing for the exotic nature of things they said were happening to them. And there was no way to corroborate that. There was no way to say, well, that didn't happen, except from the Bible. And since the Bible was not being taught, it opened the door for these prophets that are false to rise up and fill what was a condition of malnutrition in the body of Christ. Well, I have the privilege of having the Mario Marillo with me here on the Charisma News uh, show. And Mario, your blog post recently that really you just posed the question, Mario, where have you been? Um, has really caused quite a bit of a stir because you're dealing with some issues within the body of Christ that uh, you believe really need to be addressed. And um, it, it's something yep. that we want to talk about today. And I, let's let's talk about that first, because you did a follow up uh, blog where you actually named names. And mm -hmm. so um, let's kind of talk about that. What inspired you to, number one, take a break uh, from just kind of being publicly on uh, certain TV shows? Um, Let's just get into the mind of Mario Murillo and, and uh, take us into that quiet place where the Lord was telling you what to do. Well, uh, first of all, I obeyed the Holy Spirit and prayed and read the Word of God. There's a secret to telling the truth, and that is the truth telling, which is what I did, is an act of faith. It's not so much courage as it is faith, because you have to believe that if you tell the truth, no matter what, it's going to create the ultimate and best outcome. Mm. There'll be an immediate firestorm. Winston Churchill said, panic will reject it. And those who are in the deception will rail against it. Mm. But he said, in the end, there it is. And there it is. And yeah. the fact is there were things that were going on on some of the shows that I was associated with. And I went personally to the individuals that were responsible for my concern about two prophets. And I'm gonna name names, Cat Kerr and Robin Bullock. And they were identified with this gentleman in his church. And he was a regular guest alongside of me. And I went to him privately on four occasions and implored him to disassociate himself with false prophets. Hmm. And, and not only him, but also other people in the show. Uh, one individual that I'm going to mention that is a great man of God, and we're teaming up together to do rallies, is Lance Walnow. And Lance is a true man of God who studies the Word of God and understands. So after a while, it became clear that the Spirit of God was grieved by this program, was pulling people in under a political guise, yes. Effective, yes. Powerful, yes. Am I grateful for it? Absolutely. I've got nothing to say negative about that part. But the part that was an issue was the association, which has now even become a closer association with false prophets that I've named. And so I, I had to bow out. The second reason I left is because so many people are getting saved. There is a massive American soul winning uh, situation on our hands. Right now, we're, we're in the middle of a crisis, and that crisis led me to write the book, It's Our Turn Now, to talk about an undercurrent of millions of Americans who are ready right now to be born again, if we'll go and get them. We can't be playing with Jello Mountains in Heaven or Elvis. We need to be winning souls. And if that gets me in trouble with someone, then that someone needs to look deep in their own soul and say, why would that statement offend me? You know, we live in a day where we don't know male or female. And so what happens is a, a group is labeled as being oppressed. And so once they're labeled as oppressed or marginal, uh, and then they say something totally insane. Mm. I'm a cat. I'm not a person. I self-identify as a five-year-old Mexican when I'm really a 45-year-old Norwegian. And we are then put in the position where the individual who says, well, that's nuts, is suddenly labeled and given all these names and accusations. The same thing is going on right here. 
when you question the outlandish statements of these prophets, suddenly you're called divisive when it's just plain sanity and biblical reality. So let's talk about sanity and biblical reality, because that is something that I've always learned is really, really important. Whenever I've received a prophetic word or a word of knowledge, what I do is I either have it recorded or written down. Exactly. And I take it to the Bible or, and I take it to maybe my, my pastor or some, some uh, mm -hmm. spiritual leader who is doing life with me. Who's not just uh, coming alongside for a moment, but somebody right. that's walking with me and I will ask them, Hey, take a listen to this. Or what do you think this means? Or let's look at the right. word of God and compare to what it actually says. So I'm just going to throw this out there. Do you think that part of the reason we are having such an issue with some of these, um, these interesting prophecies is because of a lack of biblical literacy? It is totally the problem. And, and you know, what's interesting is that you'd bring that up because I got to say this real fast. It began in the seeker sensitive model. And that model for those that, that don't aren't familiar with church marketing ideologies is to leave out the offensive aspects of the Bible in order to get a wider hearing and people in. The problem mm -hmm. is they're really not brought in. Their bodies are there, but their conversion isn't. So, so what we have here is pastors who began to leave the Bible out. And we have individuals who today say things like we need to uncouple Christianity from the Old Testament. Hmm. Well, Paul, Paul said to Timothy, you've learned the scriptures since you were a child and they are able to correct you and give you life. Well, since the New Testament hadn't been written yet, what was he referring to? Mm -hmm. The Old Testament. Yeah. So that biblical illiteracy is a major issue in the church, but it came from all directions. From one section of the church was the marketing scheme. We need a mega church and we need to leave out the, the offensive part. But on the other side, in the charismatic movement, came people that had out of Bible experiences. Mm. And they began to feel and get a hearing for the exotic nature of things they said were happening to them. And there was no way to corroborate that. There was no way to say, well, that didn't happen except from the Bible. And since the Bible was not being taught, it opened the door for these prophets that are false to rise up and fill what was a condition of malnutrition in the body of Christ. Yeah, I, I know through my work in, in Christian media and just being able to interview a lot of people uh, that have had either near death experiences or they've, they've come back from the dead. Um, I thought I found one thing that is pretty much a common, a commonality between those people is that they are very reluctant to share the secrets that God has revealed to them during that time. And it's almost that they need to, it's years later, oftentimes that this, that this finally kind of sips out uh, or slips out. Um, but I've been able to look in people's eyes and say like, oh, there's something that's different right. there, but this is not what we're talking about. This no. we're talking about prophetic uh, visions or uh, things that are just, it, it's hard to, I, I don't see a, a, a Bible verse or chapter or verse to go with some of these things. Um, well, but, my, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. A three-year-old knows better than this stuff. There's no cows driving tractors in heaven. There's no, it's not happening. There's no chocolate milk waterfall bigger than Niagara. Well, can you imagine you're sitting in the glory of God? You're seeing the face of Christ. You're, you're absolutely in a resurrection body in the act of worship and glorification. And the Bible tells us what we're gonna do in heaven. A lot of people don't understand because they don't read the book of Ephesians, which in the third chapter says that God is hidden. The manifold wisdom of God has been hidden and will be revealed through the church. Hmm. We're going to have a role in the kingdom of the universe where the educational process goes on. And it's certainly not going to be mundane or anything of this earth. As Peter said, hmm. everything of the earth, the works of man will be burned up. So you're in heaven, the four and 20 elders are crying holy, glory to God in the highest, 
to, and to him that sits on the throne, you're, and somebody hits you in the elbow and says, how'd you like to eat some jello right now? That would be the most impossibly absurd statement that anyone can make. And the defense of it is, well, Mario, you don't know. You haven't been to heaven. Well, I haven't stuck my head in a dryer either while it was operating. But I have a pretty good scientific prediction of what it would be like. Mm. The fact is that, and I'm not meaning to be sarcastic, it's just that it's almost like the church needs electrode paddles on, mm. on its chest to get the heart beating again and simple logic and simple understanding. Some of these individuals that I'm referencing, you need to know this. They believe that we have the power to create things. That we, whatever is loosed in heaven will be loosed on earth. Whatever is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. In one conversation between these prophets, they were talking about, well, you mentioned a yellow mountain, but I like pudding. And he said, what about a, a pudding pond? Is that in heaven? And she, the, she said, well, there is now. And I'm thinking, audiences listen to this, and they're going, wow, that's really spiritual. That is yeah. absolutely a psychodrama from every conceivable perspective that is not only not in the Bible, but against the Bible. When we get to heaven, Christ is going to be the entire glory and obsession of everyone that's there. And everything yeah. we learn, everything we do will come and emanate out of that glory. Amen. Amen. Well, Mario, I, I understand what you're talking about, but I just feel like I have to ask this question for people that are, are watching and listening. Uh, why say anything? Why is this an important thing to, why can't we just let them, if you're saying that these are just fantasies, why can't we just let these fantasies happen over to the side? What is the real reason that you felt the need to address this? Well, because it crosses the line into something extremely dangerous, distraction. Mm. What we've developed is we, and there are other prophets that I could name that are also dangerously uh, to be avoided that are giving daily prophetic words to people every single day. Now, why is that dangerous? Because I have a rule that I live by. I don't ask God to speak to me directly until after I've studied his word. Mm. Because if I want messages from God and I'm avoiding the Bible as the standard, I may, I'm liable to hear anything. Sometime when a person says, well, we need to trust the spirit more than the Bible. There's individuals that have said that in order to, that's the crowbar for the spiritism to enter the church. But here's the problem. I'm not really trusting the Holy Spirit at that point. I'm taking the word of that prophet that that's what the spirit said. Mm -hmm. Now, if I go to the owner's manual, I'm going to see the patented absurdity of that statement because Jesus said the spirit of God would take what I have said and reveal it to you. He won't contradict the word of God. Amen. So, so that is an essential truth. So why is it dangerous? Well, one person commented in my blog, well, you've blasted these prophets. So please tell us who are the true prophets? And I said to them, listen to yourself. When did your Christian faith become dependent on needing a prophet? Mm -hmm. Who created this new and improved dependency of the church on a prophetic word? Other generations never had this. My generation never had it. We had the Jesus movement without daily prophetic words. I wonder how we made it. Hmm. The fact is that we are now in, an, in a setting where the issue becomes, are we going to face the uncomfortable thing? Why are so, people, so many people angry with me? Well, hmm. because you received a prophetic word, and I'm going to give you an example of one that's very dangerous. Uh, one of the people infers that you can get a second chance after you die to be saved. Well, that doesn't sound like whatever, what I've read in the Bible. No. And what it does is someone that has a loved one that is passed on. This lady has said this to them. Well, I prayed. And when I visited heaven, I saw that Christ 
pulled them out and gave them a second chance. Now, what does that do if I believe? Do I need to repent if I can get a second chance? And is this not the indulgences of the Middle Ages in the Catholic Church? And I'll show you another indulgence of the Middle Ages of the Catholic Church is to say, whenever a prophet stands there and says, you cannot understand the Bible, I have a code that God has given, and they've said this, I have a code that God has given me to interpret the Bible. So unless you trust the prophets, you're not going to get this deeper understanding. The next thing they've done is they've threatened people saying, if you doubt us, what, what the, one of the questions was asked on a certain show, a streaming show, well, will Mario lose his salvation for questioning your Jello mountains? And I'm sitting there, well, okay, at what point do we finally say this is, this, and, and it is uncomfortable and it is cringy. Mm -hmm. And people will look at me and say, Mario, why do you want to talk about all this stuff? The question is answered with another question. Why didn't we early on, as men and women of God, as pastors in fivefold ministry, when this fantasy show started, why didn't we stop it? Because wow. now it's turned in to this insane psychodrama that is embarrassing to talk about. That's the point. You know, Mari, you said one of those uh, one of those three areas was that the, the God is speaking in some sort of a code and you need people to explain that. You know, that I think that goes directly against Acts chapter two, where you had the disciples and the, the 120 in the upper room and then right. the Holy Spirit comes and fills them and they are speaking in other tongues and people all from all over are hearing them in their own language. And it's something that they went from not understanding to understanding. So I, that, as I'm Excellent. reading the word of God, that is something that I'm seeing that God is continually revealing himself, not for deeper, uh, different revelations, but is a deeper intimacy with him and bringing him, to, bringing us to the knowledge of Christ as Lord and Savior. And not only that, but again, this is medieval Catholicism. Mm. The priest understands the Bible, you can't. Well, this goes part and parcel against the whole point of the Bible. You see, this is this is the important point that everyone has to understand. The Bible was written for the common man. Mm -hmm. It was written with the notion that any person that needs God could get in the word and understand what the Bible is saying. That's how it was written. You look at the audiences that Paul had. He said, not many of you are wise, not many of you are educated, or not many of you are powerful according to this world. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Mm. How can we read that and not know that the Bible was written for the common person to be able to get it on their own, read it, and have God open their heart to truth? Mm. So this idea of I know the word and you can't get it without me. That's cultic and that is false doctrine.